Welcome to the Myrtle Beach Church of Christ and our web series, What Does the Bible Say? Presented from God's Word by Dr. Stephen Guy. I will return at the end of our program with more information about the Myrtle Beach Church of Christ. Now, join with us as we listen to this week's lesson, What Does the Bible Say? Brother Guy? Good morning, church family. And good morning to all of our guests. You are an honored guest this morning. We're so glad to have you. When we talk about church family, we really mean that. And we expect to see many of our visitors come from our sister congregations all over the area. And when you come, you are our extended family. We want you to know that. We feel that way about you. And more than one has told us over the years that when they come to Myrtle Beach, this is the highlight of their week, to be with the brethren here to worship as family. Church family is so precious. And church family, also we have our physical family that come and visit us on an occasion. Today, if you see me smile a little bigger than usual, my mom and dad are here this morning. It's the first time they've been here since we've been back, and I want you all to meet them. I told the class this morning, I've known them all my life. And they're wonderful, wonderful people. In fact, they what I am today, and I, I really appreciate them so very much. I want you to meet them after services. We talk about church family. It's so important. And you know today, and things haven't changed. When I was a teenager, I heard this expression, give me the man, but not the plan. What they meant was, we'll take Jesus, but we don't want anything to do with the church. Well, today, they're referred to as noners, which means non-affiliated. Our young people are saying, again, we believe in Jesus, we just don't go to church. They don't know what they're missing. To say, I'll take Jesus, the head, without taking the church, the body, doesn't work that way. You can't have Jesus without the church. And the church is about the Christ. And so to truly help our young people today and all of our people is to revive the concept of church family. What does it really mean to be church family? When the Apostle Paul wrote this letter you opened your Bible to, the first letter to the Thessalonians, Paul was a church planter. He would go places where the church had not been established. This is a metropolitan area. And he was only there for a few weeks. He had to leave. So this is a very young, immature church, just planted in Thessalonica. So he wanted to encourage them in their faith and to strengthen them, and to realize this importance of being church family. So you haven't already, if you already closed your Bible, open back up to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Because what Paul tells them today about being church family is the same true today. And it's so important that we share it with the world. What does it mean to be church family? Well, first of all, Paul says it means that we are part of the election Look at chapter 1 and verse 4. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. Now, right now, we're all familiar with election. We know that to be elected in our country, to be president of the United States, you have to go through a process. And there were those who said, I want to run. They registered. They announced their candidacy. They went through the primaries. We're now going through the conventions to be recognized by the certain party as their candidate. They'll run for office. On election day, we will vote one or the other into office. That's the process of being elected present in this country. Well, there is a process of being elected into the house of God, to the family of God. The Lord, from the very beginning, wanted all of us to be saved. When man sinned, he already planned to send Jesus, Genesis 3.15, the Savior. What's Christ going to do? He said, I've come to seek and save the lost. What shall we do, Jesus? When Christ died upon the cross, day of Pentecost, A.D. 33 in Jerusalem, Peter told them, when they asked, what shall we do, the answer. Repent, you believers, and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
The process by which we become the elected is by believing in Jesus. John 8, 24. You will die in your sins if you don't believe in Jesus, Christ said. To repent, change your heart and life. Luke 13 and verse 3 and verse 5. Say, I don't want to live my life from the world any longer. I want to live for Jesus. I want to be a Christian. To confess Him as the Son of God. Matthew 10, 32 and 33. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And then to be baptized, have all your sins washed away in that process, which he calls the conversion process in Acts 3 and verse 19, which is called the born-again experience, John chapter 3, 1 through 7. And when we do that, we elect to follow God. He calls us his election. In 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, Paul says, You were called by the gospel. The gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ. It's his death, burial, and resurrection. 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. And when you are baptized, according to Romans chapter 6, 1 to 4, you reenact Christ's death, burial, and resurrection. When you die to your old sins in your own mind, I don't want to sin anymore like I have in the past. I want to be right with God. You repent of those sins in your heart. You are buried in baptism and you're raised to walk in a newness of life. This is the election. It's also the calling. Are you a called out Christian? Because the word ekklesia in the Greek, the called out is what we use the word for church. The church is the called out of Christ. They're the election. They're the called out because they entered the call. And they're the chosen ones. In 1 Peter 2 and verse 9, you're a chosen generation. You're a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You should show the praise of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. In verse 3, when he says, I heard of your work of faith. Faith works. Faith comes by hearing. Hearing the word of God, Romans 10, 17. When you hear the message, you say, I want to do that. You respond to that. It's a work of faith. Not A meritorious faith. We don't earn our salvation by doing anything. We're simply receiving the gift of salvation he's given to us. That's why in chapter 1 and verse 1, he talks about the grace of the Father. Because you see, he's our Father physically by creation. But when you're born again, John 3, 1 through 7, you become the new creation. He's now your spiritual Father. He says right here in verse 1, your Father, God the Father, and your Lord, Jesus Christ, Grace be unto you and peace. You find that grace in your life. You find that peace and hope in your life. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. You are the elect people. And we are a family that pray one for another. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith. And then once you obey the gospel, all the things you do is in his name by faith. James said in chapter James 2, if, if you don't have works, you don't have faith. Show me your faith without your works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Faith shows itself in baptism and living the Christian life day by day. And so I know your work of faith, but also your labor of love. Not only are we an elect people, we are an exemplary people. You may ask the question, is it true that when I'm baptized, all my sins are washed away? Yes, the Bible says that. That means I have no sins. That's correct. Why doesn't the Lord just take me right then into heaven? Wouldn't that be wonderful? But he leaves us here. And guess what? We're in a sinful world. Are we going to sin again? Yes, you are. Can we actually fall away and be lost? Yes, you can. It's not one saved, always saved. So when I do that, and Christ comes again, I'll be lost. Yes. So why does he risk that with my life? Because he has you baptized to baptize others. He has you born again as you might share that message with others. That's why that silly, and it really is, doctrine that so many denominations accept the rapture idea, taking all the righteous out of the earth to heaven for seven years of tribulation on the earth so they can get right with God. How in the world can they get right with God if all the Christians are gone? That's what Romans 10 asks. How shall they hear without a preacher? They're not there. It doesn't make any sense sense because it's not true. When Christ comes again, that's it, folks. We're all going to be caught up in Judgment Day. 
Are you ready? The whole book of First Thessalonians is about Christ's resurrection and second coming. And every chapter ends asking that question. Look at verse 10 here in our first chapter. And to wait for his son from heaven. He's coming from heaven. In chapter 2, in verse 19, For what is our hope, or joy, or crown, or rejoicing? Are we not even in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? He's coming. In chapter 3, and in verse 13, To the end that he may establish your hearts, unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all his saints, he's coming. In chapter 4, beginning at verse, here at verse 13, he talks about not worrying about that because the Lord is going to take care of it when he comes. The dead and the living will be raised together for judgment day. So wherefore, comfort you another with these words about his resurrection and his second coming. And in chapter 5 and verse 23, And the very God of peace sets you apart holy, and I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's coming. Are you ready? So, we want the world to know what kind of life the Christians live so they will be impressed enough to want to be Christians too. So we are the salt of the earth. We're the light of the world. We're the exemplary people. Look here at verse 5 with me. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power in the Holy Spirit and with much assurance as you know what manner of men were among you for your sake. We came to you. We gave you the power of the universe. Paul said in Romans 1, 16 and 17, that the power is the word of God. It's the power of the universe. I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. It's the power of God to salvation. If you and I just understood that, we have the power in our hearts in this book to change the world. And so he says, you have that. You have that assurance can you imagine going to somebody's door? Hi, I'm from the Church of Christ. I have one question for you. Are you saved? And they say, I don't know. Are you? And we say, I don't know. What assurance do we have? What do we have to offer the world? Yes, we're saved. First John 5, 13. I wrote this unto you that you might know that you have eternal life. And if you know it, share it with a lost world. And then verse 6. And you became, in the, in the Greek here, it's the word you get, imitators. You became imitators of us. If you want to know what the Christian life is all about, you read your Bible, you see all kinds of Bible examples and characters in the Bible, real people and how they live their lives. If you want to know somebody today, just find somebody you consider to be spiritual and watch them. Watch the things they do right. Paul says, follow me as I follow the Christ. Imitate me in the good things I do. Because you see it in flesh as Christ when he walked the earth. Follow me as I follow the Christ. Having received the word with much affliction, with joy in the Holy Spirit. How do you become a Christian? You receive the word. You believe the word. You receive it into your life. But also, you transmit it as well. Look at verse 8. For, for from you sounded out, transmitted the word of God to the entire world. We are examples. We live our lives at work, at school, in our homes, on the internet, to be examples of Christians so the lost world might know. That's what we're stay, staying here for and must live like. As a result of that, he says, you suffer affliction. Why did they crucify Jesus? What did he do wrong? Nothing. But because he shined his light on their darkness, they didn't want him around. And when you shine your light at work and at school, they're not going to like you. They're going to think you're strange. Not even like you. But you live the Christian life in love and bring them to the Christ. But notice it says here, with much affliction and with joy. Do you know our early forefathers, our Christians at the first century, they marched them in to the arena there, the Colosseum, to be torn up by wild animals for the entertainment of the crowd. And, to get, and the gladiators tore them apart with their swords as entertainment. But when they did that, those Christians sang praises to God. And when they died, they prayed, praying for their enemy, the one who were killing them. 
They prayed for them as they died. And the people said, we don't want to see this anymore. And it really ceased persecution for a while in Rome. But it came back. It's all over the world now. And by the way, if you haven't noticed, it's come to our country. If you live as a Christian, you're going to be persecuted. 1 Timothy 3 and verse 12. But as a Christian, we do it with joy. Because our Lord, we're following his footsteps. 1 Peter 2, 22 and following. Hereunto were you called, that Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example, that we should follow his steps. We're following his steps. And so he says here in verse 7, so that you were examples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. You lived your life so everybody around the whole area was talking about you. Folks are talking about the Myrtle Beach Church of Christ. Why? Because we're trying to be the Church of Christ. So what we're trying to do here, we're trying to preach the gospel. You notice our mission statement you walked in? Our mission statement is to preach the word, to reach the lost, and to provide a warm and caring fellowship. That's the gospel, folks. That's the Bible. That's the church. And as a result, we have a dream. So we bought property next door for the purpose of the land to expand. We only have 200 members or so here, but we have a dream. A dream of building an extension to our building here. We've already started our school of preaching and biblical studies. Have a half dozen classes already in the can, so to speak, online for you to take. But you can come to our campus, a Christian school, a school of biblical studies, to learn the gospel better. We have paperwork out in the four years. You can join us by online and be part of our school. But you notice that that's what the early church did. Wherever they went, Paul had his own school, the Tyrannus. You build a school like that, and you get the word out in a mission field like this. And I want you to know that we have men this morning preaching in Shalot. So the congregation next to us, they haven't got a preacher right now. We're servicing them already right now with our men here. We're trying to get the gospel out. We're trying to pay down this debt. If you can help us, we greatly appreciate that. So we can start building. But also, we're going to start, start a Christian school. We already have now our Mother's Day Out program. And it's not a basic at all. It's a structured program. It helps our children to learn so they can go into our preschool, into our kindergarten, and have a Christian school here. And I've had people throughout this summer come to me and say that, you know, I had one man last week said, I'll be your principal. He said, I'd like to transfer down to here. Who wasn't? That's the one come to Myrtle Beach. But think about it. A Christian school here to get the gospel out. We have big dreams. We have big God. Amen? Amen. And so we are an example. We're here for a purpose to make a difference. But thirdly, we're enthusiastic. You can tell. We're, we're excited about this. And Christians ought to be excited. They ought to ask you at work, why are you so happy? Why do you always sing? Why are you always praying? What do you got? Jesus Christ. And when you share that with them, you share it with a lost world, folks, because they're lost and they need Jesus. We're enthusiastic. We're also expectant. Look here at verse 9. For they themselves show us what manner of entering in we had unto you. In other words, when they go to the place, they say, that church Thessalonica, which you started there, Paul, man, there, there's something else. Can you believe this? Keep reading. How you, they turned to God from idols. It's tough to convert people, especially when they're hung up on their own idols. We talked about class this morning. We all have idols. It can be your money. It can be your job. It can be your own physical family. If you love Mother and father more than me, you're not worthy of me. It could be your own pride, your own self. Whatever it is, whatever you put number one in your life, that's what you and who you worship. That's your idol. And I said in the class this morning, there's only one place God will never be. And a second place. He must be Lord of all or not Lord at all. So you must turn from your idol. This is a Gentile area full of idolatry. But he turned from idols to serve the living and true God. Everything you have will die. But not Jesus. He's the living Lord. And when you have Jesus, though you die physically, even Jesus at the grave of his best friend Lazarus told the sister... Do you believe in the resurrection? She said, in the last day, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believes in me shall never die. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? 
They did. And today, if you believe that, you can obey the gospel. And if you are born twice, if you're born physically, all of us are, but if you're born twice, if you're born of water and spirit, you only have to die once. You die physically, but if you've lived a faithful Christian life, you don't go to the second death called hell. You go to heaven to be with God. So he says right here, and to wait for his son. This word wait has many different versions of definition. And I'm afraid that when you read that, it says here to wait on the Lord, you think about sitting there twirling your thumbs. Or as they were doing, putting robes on and going to the mountain, quitting their jobs and saying, okay, Lord, we're ready. That's not what the Lord wants us to do until he comes. This, this afternoon, you probably will, will go to a restaurant and you eat. Just mark it down. The hardest person working in that restaurant is the waiter. He's waiting, or she's waiting on you. What does that mean? Serving you. Making sure every need is taken care of. More water? More bread? They're constantly serving you. That's what he means here. To wait on the Lord is to serve Him. And as we're waiting on Him, waiting on others, serving Him, will He find us waiting? Will He find us watching? Will He find us ready? That's the call of this message. Are you ready when the Lord comes? Because the Lord's church family is an elect people. Not because we're good, because He's good. We are an exemplary people. You think you're so good? No, the Lord is good. We're trying to live that life. And you can't too. We're an excited people. we got the joy down deep in our hearts. And we are an expectant people. The Lord is coming. Are you ready? This morning, we're going to have an invitation song. We stand to give you a room and time and opportunity to come into the aisle and come down forward. Behind the screen here, we have a baptistry ready for you to be baptized right now. What are you waiting for? Paul is told. Arise and be baptized. Wash away your sin. Call upon the name of the Lord. Become an elect people, an exemplary people, an excited and an expectant people. I don't know when the Lord's going to come to you. Are you going to come this morning? If you've already been baptized into Christ, not been living like you should, you can come forward. We'll pray with you and for you that you might be ready when he comes. We're going to stand to sing. You can come now. Will you come? If you're not able to be with us, join us next week for What Does the Bible Say? with Dr. Stephen Guy, minister of the Myrtle Beach Church of Christ, located at 4500 Wild Iris Drive in Myrtle Beach. And listen to A Christian Perspective on the News at 105.9 FM, mornings at 7.30 and Sundays at 9 a.m. May God bless and keep you.